Welcome back to Citizen Earned. Having just finished Basic Firearm Safety episode 20, and then The Anatomy of a Pew, How Guns Work episode 21, in order for a gun owner to be proficient and prepared to function as a militia member to defend the nation, whether that mean that they assemble into a grand organized official militia, or as an individual protecting an innocent or themselves at home or in public, the gun owner needs enough ammunition to be able to track, practice, and train with. As I previously said in those two videos, guns are kind of useless without ammunition, so you have to have enough ammunition. As I discussed in episode 18, Who to Trust, competition is a great way to hone skills, simulate stress, and discover new techniques and ways of doing things. But that means I need a lot of ammo. As I said in episode 20, Basic Firearm Safety, a new gun owner should try to fire 5,000 rounds in their first year to gain proficiency. The problem is ammunition is really expensive. For a proficient shooter to improve or maintain, at least for me to be able to maintain, I require 50 rounds a week. It's one box of ammunition. So... 50 rounds times 52 weeks a year is 2,600 rounds a year. Boy, that's going to add up quick. In episode 19, a militia member, I said, I think. Gun owners should take at least one class a year, if not more. That's what I do. It's beneficial to me. I think it'll be beneficial to most. Now, depending on the class, it might be a one-day class, it might be a week-long class. Round count might be anywhere between 300 or 2,000. So I'm just going to take an average and say 1,000 rounds per year. So one class per year equals one thousand rounds. It's so coming back to the competition thing for that practice and stress and so on and such forth to move forward and becoming a more proficient shooter. Let's say one or two competitions a year. They can range from 200 rounds per competition to 2,000 rounds. So let's just average it about a thousand rounds. Okay, so let's tally this up. That's uh, did, did, did carry the one uh, minus the nine. Um, math, uh, we'll estimate it around 4,600 rounds a year. And 4,600 rounds a year is uh, not a nice even number, and I like even numbers, so let's just go up to 5,000 rounds a year, okay? It's close enough to 5,000 rounds a year. That requires a lot of ammo. Now keep in mind, that's just to get proficient or to maintain proficiency. If then, for whatever reason, I have to actually do something with these firearms and enact, or join a militia and do something to protect the country, I have no more ammunition left, so I should probably have twice this amount for a total of 10,000 or to be able to weather some economic storms if I have enough for two years of training then I don't have to worry about panic buying or the market fluctuating up and down or this and that And this is my target number for every caliber that I have that is considered a defensible character. A defensive caliber. I think for most people that would probably be 9mm and 5.56 in the form of an AR-15 of some sort. So that's a total of 20,000 rounds. That's enough to stay, to get and stay proficient for two years. So of course, more 
is required if an individual wants to be prepared for longer. Other calibers that people might want to stock would be 40 or 45, 308, 6.5 Creedmoor. There are so many out there to choose from for beginners. Just stick to 9mm and 5.56. This is also dependent on scenarios because of course urban gun owners will have different needs than rural gun owners. Urban gun owners might not have the space that rural, rural gun owners do, so they might not be able to store that much ammunition. Those folks are going to have to figure out what it is that they need, what they feel comfortable with, and what they need. So these are some pretty big numbers. And they add up, or they equate to a whole lot of money. Let's do a little bit of math here. Now, for this example, on a cost comparison, I'm going to stick to 9mm. It is one of the least expensive rounds available. Uh, it is a defense caliber. It's big enough to be used for defense. And uh, I realize a 22 long rifle is typically cheaper, but let's just stick for nine for simplicity's sake. Most of the time, normal prices for nine millimeter is about 20 cents a round. So nine. 20 cents a round, or we're going to do a little bit of uh, decimaling. We can turn that into 0 0.20 dollars a round, right? And initially I said 10,000 rounds, so 10,000 times 0 0.20 equals $2,000. That's a lot of money. That's like car money in some instances. So this can get pretty expensive. Well, hang on, we're gonna make this cheaper. Even at just the bare minimum for a beginner, that's 5,000 rounds. And that's a thousand dollars a year. So that's pretty expensive. So I have this requirement. And I need to shoot all these rounds so that I can be a responsible, law-abiding, proficient gun owner. And how am I going to afford this? This is a lot of money. So I started just doing some research and I got into reloading. And just to get some quick numbers going here, again, you might have to refer back to the Anatomy of a Pew, episode 21, to familiarize yourself with what the various parts of the round are. The primer typically works out to about three cents per primer. And the propellant, also referred to as powder, is between three and five cents a primer. Depending on how much you use and which powder you're buying and all of that. The case is free because I just pick it up on the range. And the projectile or the bullet, whoops, can't write today, typically runs between 7 and 11 cents per projectile. So if we add this up, we get between 13 and 19 cents per round. So that's not, that's between seven and one cent cheaper. So if you're gonna spend all the time to reload all of this ammo, that might not be worth it. So I kept digging, I kept looking. What if I can eliminate the projectile or the bullet? Just erase it. Well, now my price is between six and eight cents a round. That's almost 22 long rifle prices. That's like reasonable. So the process is find a shooting range that will allow its members to mine the backstops or pull the shot bullets uh, out of the backstop be able to reclaim the lead in that backstop.
or find land in some other way. I've tried car batteries, uh, or, and I've asked dentist offices for uh, the little lead backers that they use to take x-rays of one's teeth. Tiny little thing, but they take a lot of x-rays and over a year, can usually get you 20 or 30 pounds. Ways. Or you can buy it from rotometals.com and you can buy the proper type of lead alloy. Now lead has to be mixed with antimony and tin to give it the right hardness or pliability for different speeds. That's getting pretty nerdy and pretty deep. Check out Fortune Cookie 45LC, link down below. I learned everything about casting bullets from him, well, from his YouTube channel. He's a great guy, he has fantastic information, spend some time there. With the lead being mined, then have to smelt the lead to purify it into ingots. There we go. This is just a lodgepole Dutch oven. New camera location. Yes, mask because lead and lead gas and other nasty stuff. So, oh, look at that smoke. Yeah. Whoops, whoops, whoops. So, lead is heavier than anything else. So, it's going to go to the bottom and everything else, including rocks, are going to float to the top. Now at this point, a lot of people like to use wax, uh, paraffin wax, and create a big fireball, and they say that it actually cleans up the lead. I don't think so. I've reclaimed a lot of lead. I think it's a wasted effort and money. And then we use just a regular old stainless steel soup ladle. Gotta be fast on this, they're hot. There you go. 20 pounds in about an hour. No wasted or used water. Just straight from the pot. Cheap as heck. Then cast bullets from that those purified ingots. Then casting in a circle to warm up the molds for about 10 minutes now. Uh, trying to be as careful with my molds as I possibly can. Uh, being kind to one's molds is a good thing. I always want to leave hot lead in the mold to keep it warm, keep the temperature in the mold, as it is a fairly cool day today. And the majority of the bullets are coming out looking next to near perfect. So, I'm about to start casting. Now, most people, including the manufacturer, says, or provides the instructions to blacken the mold, or carbon up the mold by putting some um, paraffin-based wax into the pot at the top and letting it scorch kind of the inside of the mold. That's used as a release agent so that the bullets will fall out of the mold much more easily. But as you can see, if you simply maintain your mold nicely, they do come out very easily without a lot of external motivation. And 
And as a result, the molds last a lot longer. There's a lot less carbon buildup. There's a lot less cleaning of the inside of the mold. So finally, I will be dropping the sprue here and knocking out the cast bullets into a bucket of water. Dropping them into a bucket, bucket of water provides at least one Brunel point hardness point in addition to the lead already being mostly of the appropriate alloy being that it came from reclaimed bullets on the back side. Started off with bullets, so it's probably the correct hardness. As those who cast bullets can tell anyone, a cast lead bullet has to be matched to the velocity it will be fired. So a magnum cartridge being fired at 13 to 1600 feet per second will have to be significantly harder than say a subsonic 45 ACP traveling at 850 or 800 feet per second. And I'm gonna do this until the pot is empty. That'll probably take about two hours or so. This is a 20 pound Lee pot. And here's a little bit of math that you can do at home if you would like to. Casting 124 grain 9 millimeter bullets. There's 7,000 grains in one pound. And I have a 20 pound pot. So I'll let you figure out how many bullets I cast out of one pot in about two hours. Now, time to remove it from the water and dry it out. And then put them all through some quality control to find all of the ones that were cast incorrectly. Return them to the pot for the next time. And then get all of them dry for coating. People might be thinking that lead is poisonous. It is, but it is only poisonous where it's aerosolized, so where it's floating in the air. So either when I'm smelting it in the barbecue, or it's coming off, there are fumes coming off this pot. Those are the problems. So as long as I either wear a mask or get air to push those vapors out of the way and out of my lungs, there should be no problems. Touching the lead like this with my skin is perfectly fine. So thus far with the blood tests that I have run with as much exposure that I've had to lead, that theory proves to be accurate. Now having quality controlled the bullets, having returned the ones that don't stack up and have imperfections in them to back to the furnace, uh, have to clean them in order to be able to coat them. So, Gatorade bottle filled with acetone. Because, you know, human hands have all kinds of oil and dirt on them. Sieve. Recapture. Recapture the acetone because why not? Waste not, want not, and dump it out on a rag so that the acetone can't evaporate. Then, where did my funnel go? I found my funnel. Get the acetone back into. the Gatorade bottle and start over again. Okay, and make sure to store the acetone in the Gatorade bottle or any bottle that seals, otherwise it will evaporate. Coat the bullets. So here I'm just using a regular coffee scale. Uh, I got this after the great Hafer imparted the golden ratio for coffee. So this is not the same ratio since this is not coffee. 
but the coffee ratio is 16.7 to 1. If you know, you know. If you don't, you're SOL. But for this one, for the bullet coat, ratio is 20 grams per 100 milliliters. Don't go over. I know this is boring. Measuring being accurate is boring. But it is important. These, by the way, are dedicated cooking utensils that I use for just this purpose. I do not use them for kicking cooking. Oh, and I never covered this, but this is high-tech bullet coating from Australia. I don't think that was an Australian accent. Let's try again. Good day, mate. Australia. I don't know. Whatever. I just sound like an idiot. That's okay. And they managed to get paid. I don't think I'm going to get paid for this. Though. Okay. Now, for easy future reference, I'm going to mark the bottle so I don't have to weigh it every single time. Yeah? Yeah. And you say, this bottle... That'll be good enough. Is a hundred milliliters anyway. So I don't need to get too particular. So I just gotta fill it up. Now we use some handy dandy acetone. As you can see throughout this entire process, I tend to go through a lot of acetone, so I buy in bulk. Now we just fill this guy. Oop. Oop. Isn't that what the minion said? Gaspacho! I'm out of acetone! This is terrible! I'll have to go get some more acetone and then we'll continue. Yeah. And. Oh gosh! That was a mess I should have used. Um. Uh, funnel. Also, make sure that all possible heat and or fire sources are controlled at this point because acetone is flammable. Now, what they don't tell you is be careful with this. It likes to produce gas and expand. I don't know if it's a chemical reaction or if it's releasing bubbles inside the powder. So, all I'm going to do is squeeze all the possible air out put the lid on without spilling too much also keep in mind acetone likes to evaporate so if you leave the lid off too long you're gonna lose money 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 okay and now we mix that up and we got a beautiful bottle of ketchup so pretty. It's so pretty. Can you see that? You see that? You see the swirls? I don't know if you can see that. I think the light might be coming from the wrong. It's so pretty. Now, you're going to have to figure out on your own what your proportions are, okay? Because I don't have access to the same containers that you have access to. But what I found is we're going to cook them in this little oven, uh, toaster oven that I bought for like. $20 off of Craigslist. And I use this container, a fairly large container that used to house creamy peanut butter in it. Um, this container works well with this garlic stuffed olives container full of bullets. Fill those bullets up to my line. Pour them into the mixing container. <laughs> and then, this stuff lasts forever. 
You don't need much, okay? Not much at all. This is probably enough for about 10,000 bullets. So, we're just gonna give it a, maybe another, and then, you might wanna do this in a well-ventilated area because there's a lot of fumes that comes off of this. Or you're in for a good time. Just a little bit more. And I'm seeing a lot is uh, caking on, not sticking to the bullets and caking on to the sides. So I'm gonna lock it in here. Also good workout. So you will hear when you're done agitating or mixing in the coat. Um, it'll be like a real nice uniform, like swish, swish, swish. And then when it gets kind of tacky and sticky, i.e. enough acetone has evaporated off of the mixture to leave the bullet coat on the bullets. It'll kind of do like a tick, 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 tick. So it'll go from like a swish, swish, swish to a tick, tick, tick. Let's see if I can make it happen. Hear the swish. Hear it turn to the tink, tink, tink. And then we just get them properly spread out. Like so. Stuff to the side, because there's not enough space, because there's too many projects, because there's not enough time. <sighs> and ting ting. You can feel them peeling off of one another. Because the bullet coat is so sticky. Okay. And now we let dry for an hour. Why an hour? Because um it's assured that they'll dry and be completely dry. You see, if you put them wet into the oven, then bullet coke bubbles and cracks, and then you've defeated all of the work that you just did to get the bullet coat on there. Um, so, be back in an hour. Okay, warm, warm, uh, time to put them in. Another church for seven minutes. See you in seven. I love the smell of fresh roasted bullets. Uh, now be careful. These guys have been roasting at about 375 for seven minutes. Now I like to get a little bit of a bump and a wiggle just to make sure they don't melt to one another. Um, like with most hot things that come right out of the oven, um, Gonna let them cool for a little while. So, uh, see you in a little while. Okay, so now they are super cool. Cool to the touch, anyway. I don't know if you can see that, but that's what they're supposed to look like. Not too much, uh, less is better. So, uh, that's two coats in, good to go. Size the bullets. Mm -hmm. When it gets full, dump it into the bullets that are ready to load. Clean the brass. Uh, getting them clean is imperative. So, in the wet tumbler they go. Some simple green. And then some lemmy shine. Don't forget to add the water. And the steel pins, most importantly. That's enough. Plug. Yeah. 
and timer. Since that still has soap in it, I'm going to take it to the shower and while I'm spinning it like that, rinse some fresh water over it to get all of the uh, soap off. Uh, after the clean water rinsing, I want to get as many of those steel pins out as I possibly can. So I'm just going to spin it a couple of different ways until it has everything out. And then we'll take a look at the um, pretty new clean brass. new clean brass not bad for 15 minutes of tumbling wet tumbling is vastly superior of course can't do anything with these until they are dry so back to the toast old toaster oven okay i've got the toaster oven going And in they go for 20 minutes. And then we get to assemble it all into one thing, which involves depriming, sizing, repriming, flaring the case mount, pouring the propellant, seating the bullet, and crimping the case. Fantastic. Bullets made, brass clean and dried, ready to reload. I'm not going to go through all of the particulars on reloading. If you're interested in doing this and reloading, Please buy a reloading manual and look up reliable recipes from reliable sources, like any powder company, and then work within the bounds of those recipes. Also verify what's happening with the bullet with a chronograph. This is a progressive press, a Dillon 550, and it has four stations. I'm going to briefly explain what happens at each, each station and then demonstrate how it works. So this station will deprime, resize, and reprime the casing. This station will drop the powder and flare the casing. This station will seat the bullet, and this station will crimp the case onto the bullet. Let me demonstrate. Resize, deprime, you can hear the little click. Reprime. Next one. Powder drop. Flare the case. Next one. We'll seat the bullet. And the next one. We'll crimp the case onto the bullet. What that means is it's squishing the brass onto the bullet, causing a tighter seal. And then it'll kick it out into the little bucket. So the reason that this is called a progressive is because it does a whole bunch of things all at once. And with every pull of the lever, it will produce a round. Let me show you. To me, it sounds like the intro to Pink Floyd's, what is that, Money? I know the song, but I don't know the title because I'm not a big Floyd fan. Anyway, with this machine, 
I can typically produce about three to 400 rounds an hour. They make other presses that will do more and faster. But as you've seen the whole bullet making process, this, you realize that the slowest part is not the reloading. It is in fact making the projectiles. So I'm gonna put my money and efforts into speeding up that process first. Anyway, there you go. That is how to reload your own ammo. spent on what kind of reloading equipment to be able to save time down the road and knowing that spending money on consumables like propellant and primers will keep the costs moving up I started to save money after reloading 5,000 rounds which is my first year requirement after 10,000 rounds which is my total year requirement cost savings were significant and since I've been doing this for a while now I can say that after five years of reloading at least 10,000 rounds a year the cost of nine millimeter is being sustained at about seven to eight cents around so at seven cents around That's 10,000. Seven hundred dollars for all 10,000 rounds. Or if we do 5,000, that's 350. Now that's reasonable. That's like a cup of coffee, a fancy cup of coffee, once or twice a week. This does require work. Uh, this does require having more time than money. Of course, if an individual has more money, then they would just go out and buy the ammunition. And they wouldn't have to invest all of this time into the knowledge. Here's another side effect in that as I reloaded, I started to understand guns and ammunition much better. Um, the knowledge is worth it. However, if someone doesn't have the time, then just buy the ammo. What if someone doesn't have the time or the money? Again, it comes down to the, uh, the dry firing. Remember, always firearm safety. Finger off the trigger, make the gun is pointed in a safe direction. I will make it safe. Oh, and this is a rifle. We're talking about pistol, pistols. So let's make the ATF mad here real quick. Uh, okay, now we got a pistol. Great. So trying not to flag myself because now all of a sudden it's very short. And dry firing with a safe firearm. Just focus on that trigger control. And that's how I can stay proficient, possibly get better, although it's kind of difficult to get better without ammunition, but I can at least maintain proficiency uh, while dry firing. Now keep in mind, if you do decide to get into reloading, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can sell to friends, family, or just anyone out there. Um, selling ammunition typically denotes a business, and that means that you need an FFL and a whole bunch of other stuff to legally be able to sell ammunition. However, there isn't anything that prohibits you and your friends from putting together a reloading station and everybody reloading their own ammunition. So there is a possibility of making the buy-in costs of reloading equipment even less and getting to that break-even point and getting to that cheap ammo even faster. Just remember, everybody has to reload their own ammunition. Also, 
don't take my word for it. Go verify with your state and federal laws. I've covered some of the, the gun regulation out there, but make sure to go check and make sure that you are okay. This is not legal advice. So if someone asks you, why do you need 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, or 100,000 rounds? It all comes down to being a proficient, law-abiding, responsible gun owner. It's not just a preference. It's almost a requirement. So since I took an oath, this is my responsibility. And to me, it kind of makes sense that it's every person's responsibility that's an American. I don't see why it wouldn't be. With all of the factors of gun ownership covered, it's time to get into how guns are misused. Although the Second Amendment is honorable and millions of people discharge billions of rounds every year, too many people still suffer from gun violence every year. And as a result, I had to investigate just how dangerous guns are to see how it informs my actions to honor my oath. Catch you on the next one.